Welcome to the Tech Sales Show, dedicated to making you a better seller. Recorded 4,827 miles across the Atlantic Ocean with Bobby Das from Houston, Texas, a father, husband, golfer, pilot, and tech seller. And Brian Evans, an expat in London, England, family man, 2X Iron Man, and an ERP salesman. Both sharing tried and true sales strategies and providing free tools to make each week and campaign easier for you. They also answer your questions weekly. Now, here is Bobby and Brian. What's up, Brian? Hey, Bobby. It's been a long time since we've really sat down and recorded. It's almost been two and a half weeks or so. It has indeed. It has indeed. You've been out for a uh, exciting golf vacation. Why don't you tell us about that? Yes, if you guys on this podcast listening, driving somewhere or sitting somewhere or riding a train somewhere, I just played five amazing rounds of golf in the state of Wisconsin. Not where I would have thought the greatest golf in the world might be, but uh, there was some great golf. We played Aaron Hills, home of the 2017 U.S. Open, which was an amazing course. It's got a great story. I think there's a documentary on it. Uh, it's got some murder in it. It's a great story how that place got built. Not that someone died, but good story. And then uh, just across on Lake Michigan, we played all the courses in the Whistling Strait families, and that's where they are holding the 2020 Ryder Cup and wow. also famously known for the course where Dustin Johnson grounded his club in the 2010 PGA Championship and lost a major. I remember that. So you were there for, what, three days, four days total? How many rounds? Six total, five straight days of golf, yeah. Five straight days of golf. One round of golf per day? Yes, sir. In some impressive, pretty good terrain. It was good. And it was like actually hotter than Houston. Good stuff. I only took winter clothes, and then I had to buy a bunch of summer clothes while I was there. So uh, I got a bunch of extra shorts now. Yeah, of course. That's always the way it works out. Well, and I know you recorded and mentioned briefly that there was a pretty big wedding in your hometown. Uh, give a quick recap of the wedding and what it meant to your family and friends that were there to watch it with you. Yeah, it was cool. Um, I live in Windsor, which is right outside of uh, London. It's about an hour on the train outside of London. It's where the the Queen of England uh, lives, uh, and uh, it was amazing. Uh, we had Windsor is this small town of about ten thousand people, but it's got a it's got the oldest inhabited castle in the world here. It's about a thousand years old, and it's where the queen lives on the weekends. So uh, Henry and Meghan Markle had their wedding here uh, just a couple weeks ago, and uh, the Is long his name walk. Henry? Harry, Harry, yeah, Harry. Harry. Yeah, that's Harry. right. Yeah, Harry. You I can tell how. Bu- I didn't want to start a bunch of rumors there of the royal, <laughs> yeah. royal fanatics on there. Yeah, you can tell how into this I am. It's been. <laughs> I mean, it was it was exciting. The town did a great job. You know, this is a small town of ten thousand. We had a hundred and ten thousand people. Wow! Uh, descend upon Little Windsor, um, but it was a good time. Like uh, I camped out overnight, reserved a good spot for the family. My wife had uh, a couple friends in town. You know, we had a front row spot to the to the wedding procession. Is that what you call it? When they're, yeah, when they're the post wedding parade yeah, per se post wedding parade. Yeah. They had a front row seat to it. So they had a great time and I had a bike race out in East England. So I watched it from TV in my house and then jumped in my car and hustled out to East England for a, for a race the next morning. That so was like two miles. Everyone right? was happy. That bike race was two miles. It was, yeah, it was 102 miles. That's right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Brian rides a lot. Um, so maybe we'll put a picture of each of those things in the show notes in case anybody cares to see golf, uh, Brian riding a bike, or the royal wedding. So Let's do it. Today is my brainchild, my baby, my favorite topic that I like to talk to people about, Brian. But let's beforehand, let's tease the next set of things we're going to be sharing in a few weeks. Yes. So, um, and it, it's my one of my favorite topics is around interviewing. Um, and I, I broke this up into two different parts. So... The, it's going to be a two-part listener's choice. It's a, it's, we get, I would say that it's one question, but really we get, a, I don't know, two or three questions a week about someone that's inter- interviewing for a new job or wants to interview for a new job. Uh, so we provide a, a bunch of best practices here. So the first part of this listener's choice will be about how to get the interview. So if it's a company you really want to work for or you're thinking about a career change, how do you get in the door? 
Um, and then it's going to be it's going to be more, more nuanced than just build a great network, right? It's gonna, we're going to get a lot deeper than that. And then the second part of this is going to be how to nail the interview. So you get the you get this interview. Um, it's for something that you want to change your life, change your career. Um, it's worth the time. It's worth the effort to uh, get prepared for that interview. So we're going to talk through uh, both of those in great detail. Perfect. So that would be like, are we talking just dress code and stuff? Or are we talking how to really prepare the mindset? It's so how to nail the interview is, is around preparedness. Like what kind of questions I talk about, and it's, it's a principle that applies to everything, whether it's a meeting or an interview or whatever it is you're doing. It's about nailing the first 30 seconds. We're going to talk about what kind of sales stories you need to have ready. We're going to talk about um, what kind of research to do for the company that you're interviewing with. We're going to talk about emotional awareness, self-awareness, red flag kind of questions that you should be listening for. Uh, we're going to be talking about your passion, Bobby, is around follow-up and how to like keep a conversation going with an executive uh, I use a lot of the things that you and I have talked about over the past ten years. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a fun uh, series. Good stuff. Good stuff. So today we're kicking off our next series. This is our fourth series so far, I believe, and this is all about sales process. Now, this is something I've talked about for years, and I truly believe it's something that made me a perennial seller many years ago because I didn't know how to sell. I hadn't gone through a lot of training, and someone luckily put a a PDF on my table and I started following that and I started having a lot of success and I've never looked back. And what I find most surprising is I I interact with salespeople all the time from partners to other vendors to competitors. And when I ask them for feedback or tips and tricks around their sales process, they don't have one. Everyone will talk about a methodology and we've probably all read the books on spin selling and the challenger sale, which is our favorite. And we'll probably talk more about that throughout the next few episodes but it's truly the steps that you take to both generate pipeline move pipeline through that funnel and then get it closed and then negotiate it and then win it at a marketable price for you and your company um brian have you ever heard me talk about some weaknesses around sales process only once or twice this would be this would be brand new no i mean (laughs) this is um you were as we've talked about before you were my manager at microsoft and um uh, we had a, you know, I went on those team calls and in those group meetings, uh, we had a lot of conversations about uh, how do we manage risks in the deals that we're working? How do we uh, put ourselves in the best possible position to win a deal? It's all about sales process. We'll talk about a lot of tips and tricks to kind of get you back on track when you fall off track. But today's mostly going to be about an introduction to the series. And you just hang in there because I want to lay some groundwork down and some vocabulary down so we're all on the same page as we talk through what is a sales process and, and the differences between those methodologies that we talked about. In the last episode, probably a four or five episodes of this series, we're going to talk about kind of the top eight or ten methodologies, sales methodologies that are used in the tech world. And then pick our favorite one, which I already gave away. But but we want to talk today about, and over the next few weeks, about the process that you follow and why that process is so important. I can tell you that even today, I could see process breaking down today in a meeting and knew we were losing real time in our sales cycle by not following a process. Uh, and it was devastating to me. And the person just was asking questions that were four or five stages away in, in the sales process that weren't important and these weren't the right people to answer those questions, but it it was part of some training somewhere, so he was doing it. I personally believe this is the biggest weakness of good and mediocre sales reps that I interact with on a daily basis. Brian, what are your thoughts on how you see people using or lack of their use of a sales process in your daily sales campaigns? Yeah, I mean, I think about it a lot of the same way I think about a territory plan. It's like we we called out the obvious on the territory plan that it's not a territory plan that helps you achieve your number. It's the thoughtfulness that goes into how you're going to execute on your quote unquote business. And then if you're following a consistent pattern on ex- pattern on executing on your business, you know how to make changes to it as things go wrong or things go right. Even, you know, you've got a, you've got a scientific approach to your territory and it's the same way as a deal if you, if you approach every deal in an inconsistent fashion, you're never going to uh, improve or understand 
where you need to make adjustments to improve your odds. I love that analogy because we spent so much time on the territory plan and we kind of broke it down. It's very similar what we're going to do in this, but we're going to break it down at the deal level and hopefully share with each of you how to use this process to control and, and, and take it, take control of those deals and move them through your funnel. So mostly a lot of stories and experiences over the next four or five weeks, uh, but we do believe that this will teach you how to take control, not only control, but create some opportunities, control those opportunities, and then dominate those opportunities through this sales process. So let me run everybody quickly through the agenda that we think is going to happen over the next four or five weeks. So today we're just introducing you to our plans and the process, kind of laying the fundamentals, the groundwork, and the vocabulary that we want everybody to be on, on the same page with. Next week it'll be part two. We're going to talk about how to use a process to find prospects. I think it's a weakness that anybody that's been in the business more than an inside sales rep who's in their first year of using their time effectively to prospect for customers. It doesn't get the attention that should get, so our funnels are always empty. We're gonna teach you how this process will help you find those prospects. Part three, we're gonna talk about how to find latent pain with a process. This is how deals get big. This is how you don't negotiate over pennies on a price and how you can also grow your deals. Latent pain, in short, is the pain the customer has that the customer doesn't even know they have. Brian, how about four and five from you? Yep. So number four, we're going to talk about how to control the sales cycle with a process. Um, I think every prospect I've worked with, whether it's somebody that we've done business with or somebody that we uh, want to do business with, they've got a process in their mind about how they want to evaluate, uh, whether it's your hardware or your software. And we're going to talk about how you take control with, with your own process and then kind of measure and iterate on that. And then part five, we're really going to wrap it up. There's a number of methodologies, as you talked about, Bobby, whether it's spin selling or the challenger sell, um, whatever you want to call it. There's a number of these type of methodologies uh, that we'll talk about, but and we'll kind of summarize these a bit and talk about how you can apply these to uh, refine your approach and process. Perfect. So let's jump into kind of part one of this and why a sales process. If you're new to tech sales, you probably know how to get your customer to do something you want them to do, which is you're probably being paid to have them do something you want them to do, like buy your product or buy your services or buy your software. Maybe it's just about how to take a meeting or maybe take a call if you're an inside rep or a, a, a business development rep of some sort. But what, what steps do you take? I mean, you don't just ask them. I mean, there is a methodology, more of a process that goes on in your mind and in their mind to get them to yes. And that's why a process is so important. Um, if you find prospects, I guess the math, this is all a math problem. We talked about this in your spreadsheet around territory plans and how we get to our quota. I think I think about it from the same same perspective in my, my quarterly quota or my monthly quota or whatever I'm trying to achieve. But this process should drive my behavior to get to my number and exceed my number. So we talked about territories and big numbers and big swags. But if I need to meet with... Two, two people, 10 people to get two people to buy something from me. There's probably a, a number of people I have to call to get those 10 meetings, right, Brian? We talked about that in sure. the territory plan. And if those two people average purchase deal size to me is $100,000, then I know I got to make 100 phone calls to talk to 10 people to get two of them to buy my swag for $100,000 each. That's $200,000. Well, that's great. And if that's what you do to get those two people to buy your $100,000 stuff, what if I were to say a process, effective process, and your utilization of that process could turn those same 100 phone calls into eight buyers? Uh, would that be interesting? Go from yeah, 200000 to 800000 Yeah, and it's really all, I mean, it, it's really all about focusing our efforts, right? We, you... At some level, you have to either, maybe you know because you've, you've had experience in this industry, maybe it's a new industry for you that you're selling into and you need to, to gain this uh, insight, but you need to know like what this potential or likely buyer looks like. Am I right? Because you're, you're effectively what you're talking about, Bobby, is improving your batting average here by focusing your efforts on the right kind of customers. Am I right? So you are right, Brian, but I'm also thinking, what if I hit the ball farther? What if I didn't just hit base hits? What if I started hitting triples and home runs? I think that the process can make your deals bigger, better, and much more meaty, uh, which is going to benefit you as well. 
Good. Yeah, I think everyone will be interested to uh, get into that. So our process thoughts should help all of you get kind of the hard work done in less time. And I think everyone will be listening when they take a $200,000 quote and turn it into an $800,000 number or a $200,000 number to an $800,000 number. So let's start breaking it down. I think average sellers and perennial sellers are the, are the best way to look at it. Uh, process versus methodology. And I think a perennial seller uses a process with a solid methodology. And that's kind of the goal of the series. We've used this before, I'm sure, but it's been maybe a few podcasts ago. Maybe not everybody's seen it. Tiger Woods is back in the PGA Tour. He's, he's, he's like 30th. It's shocking. He's it's amazing. played six events, and uh, he's right in the top 30 all over again. He's, he's, did that. he's doing that because he's a great golfer. But what makes him a great golfer? It is practice. He hits a million balls still with a bad back. He's going on practicing, or he would nowhere near be that good. Yes, he's got raw talent. But he practices. You just rode 102 miles a couple weeks ago. Is that the first time you've ridden a bike in the last 60 days? No, of course not. I mean, look, you know, you see my Strava file. You know that um, I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive with this, much like you are with your uh, with your golf. Um, it's it's all about it's all about practice. It's all about uh, failing and and getting better and being underprepared and having the wrong nutrition and then getting the nutrition right. It's um, it's taken many, many failed attempts and many attempts that have worked out for me. And I think w- when I think about, you talked about Bobby, the kind of an average seller and a perennial seller. Um, it, we, we've just had a one of the top sellers here in England move to, to become a, a regional sales director. And when I think about how the way he runs his business, he's very deliberate about where he invests his time and which prospective customers he invests his time to the point to where everyone around him notices it. And I was, it got me thinking, um, as I kind of looked around at the top sellers, you know, across the, the, the region I'm in, they're kind of all that way. Every, you know, it sometimes comes off a little arrogant even, potentially. I mean, that's the risk, right? Of that's taking it to too far of an extreme. But it's if you're going to, you know, to kind of further this baseball analogy that we've given here, if you're going to hit triples, you're going to need to wait for the right pitch. And these these perennial sellers are always waiting for that right pitch. Maybe even see more pitches than other batters because they're a little patient if we're going to wear that analogy out. And I'll, I'll say that it does take practice. It does take at-bats. Um, maybe that's the last time I'll reference it. But they have a methodology and a process. But we're talking about the process. So I hear reps often – in sales meetings, QBRs, whatever else, a, a, a sales manager. And by the way, sales managers listening, this would help you so much doing your one-on-ones and helping your reps. But if a rep is asked from a sales manager, are we going to get that deal this quarter? The reps almost always use a probability. Yeah, it's 50-50. And, and the, the manager will say, what do we have to do to get done? And say, oh, we're not winning on price. Or they'll talk about the two or three things that, are, that, that aren't helping them win. And those aren't the process steps that would give you the answer to his original, his or her original question. It's not about the gut feel that you have or the things you haven't accomplished, the, the competition's accomplishing. It's more about the steps and the verifiable outcomes to go from stage to stage to stage. So over the yeah. next four or five weeks, we're going to talk about six stages and a bonus that I'm going to throw in at the end. In each episode, we're going to talk about a couple of stages. The first episode next week, we're going to talk about prospect and qualify. That's stage one and stage two. And we maybe we'll tie some percentages to them, but your science is going to have to drive some of that percentages to, for you. But I have prospects and then I have, I have to qualify those prospects. And if you think about those as stages in the funnel, um, if you're listening and not aware of a funnel, a funnel would look like a, a V and at the top, the bar at the very top of that would be my prospects and the next bar down would be qual- the qualify stage. In week three, we're going to talk about develop and solution. Again, these are stage names. So by episode three, you'll know about prospect, qualify, develop, and solution. And I would say with a process, I can almost tell a rep that I'm managing or that I'm peers with at that stage of the game whether they're going to win or lose. 99% of the time, uh, 95% of the time. Because of if they've accomplished all the things they should have accomplished in the process to that point. And finally, we'll have proof and close. Those are the final 
five and six stages of the sales process that we're going to talk about. And then the bonus is going to be how do you manage it after the sale in, in, in a stage that I'll call deploy, where you really hold the customer's hands through that first level of deployment, then it's an amazing effect that you'll have because during deploy, you should start prospecting again in that customer. And if you use that sales process, guess what's going to happen? Your funnel's always going to be full. Yeah, and I think the I think what people will appreciate this, even if even if you just take bits and pieces of this and apply it to your own your own sales gig, it's when you when you sit down with your manager to have that one on one, and he's drilling you, he or she is drilling on your pipeline, and they're getting pressure from above, right? It's it's not that they're looking to create this pressure; they're getting pressure to uh, to forecast business, and they're trying to pressure test you to know if they should forecast that deal on your behalf or not. This will give you a lot more um, scientific way to talk about your own business and and kind of get you out of almost get you out of the hot seat a little bit, right? Because there there are always going to be ways you could improve your deal. And if you can talk about your deals in terms of uh, where you have gaps or shortfalls or where you're actually really doing well, it turns into a much more interesting and valuable conversation, which will then give you a much better feel as to whether or not you should be committing this deal or not to your manager and give him or her uh, the, the confidence to, to bring that deal forward or not. That's a good point. You know, maybe some people listening don't really know what we're going to teach them in each one of these stages of the sales process. So just for an example, you can't go from developing your opportunity to creating a solution for your customer if you don't have a commitment to get to power. Often in in young sales reps' careers, they struggle to ask for that seat at the table with the power person. Who's going to really write the check? I can still today ask almost any rep, who's the final person that's going to sign off on this multi-million dollar deal? And if they say Joe Blow, the administrator, they're wrong. He ain't going to write that check. So we're going to teach you throughout this sales process each kind of step along the way and verifiable outcome that you need to have to go to the next stage. Yeah, and to to even further that example, because we've all been in this position, right, to where we have a hungry prospect. They keep telling us all the right things, Bobby. Man, we love your technology. It's the greatest stuff ever. Here's the business challenge we're trying to solve for. You guys are just a perfect fit for us, but trust me, you don't need to meet our CIO, our CTO, our CFO, or human resources vice president. You, you, don't worry, I, you you got me. I know all the pains. I know all the problems. You got me to deal with. We've always we've all been in that challenging situation, right? Uh, this at least gives you a conversation that when you're sitting down with your manager to talk about, look, I love this deal. I love this prospect because they kind of fit into the right industry. They fit into the right pain. You know, they've got the same kind of challenge that a lot of our customers have that we've been able to solve. All these things are going right for us, but here's where I'm struggling. This is this is what I could use some help with. Meaning getting to power. So Meaning getting when you to have power. that and then when you have that conversation with your boss, you can you guys can come up with a tactic or a way to overcome that shortfall to move your deal forward without spending more cycles, without going to more lunches, without playing golf one more time. It's not going to move the needle if you don't get these verifiable outcomes done. And probably your boss will be able to help come up with an idea on how you can get that meeting with the next level person up to find out, are we ever going to get the power? Um, We talked about it way early on in that first meeting episode that we talked about the dead plant. This is the way for you to really recognize a dead plant, stop watering it, move on, and go find some new plants to get engaged with. So we talked a little bit about process and methodology, and I don't want anybody to be confused. So let's re- reset. The process here is a process that Brian and I both spent a lot of time with at Microsoft. Their branding of it's called solution selling. It is the stages by which you follow step by step by step the process to find a deal and then get a deal booked and then deployed. There's a good book out there. It's a few years old now, but it's called The New Solution Selling. We'll put a link in the show notes. And if you're a fan of ours at all, click that link and buy the book through that link so we get a little bit of money. Brian and I are getting hungry here. We need some uh, support from our fan base. And then the second book, which is really the methodology of this whole thing, that being the process, the methodology by which we, we try to spend all of our brain power on, 
is really the book called The Challenger Sale. We'll also put a link in the show notes. You should also click that link and then buy that book from that link so that the tech sales show can make a little bit of coin here finally. Yeah, I mean, you should, and, and you should read them both. Uh, even if you just decide to go with the, the uh, what do they call it, the Cliff Notes version of it. I mean, the, the Challenger Sell, I mean, Bobby, you know, that's that's my favorite selling book of all time. It's teaching, tailoring, and taking control of the deal. Um, it's, a, it's a great methodology that you should understand that fits very nicely into this framework. Yep, and we will definitely put links in the show notes for that. And then we'll recap all the other ones that you may be your boss's favorite and all that in the fifth episode of this series so that you can have those as well and put links to all those books in the show notes as well at the end of that episode. So we've covered a lot of stuff today, but mainly I want you guys to remember six phases of our sales process, six stages, we'll call them stages, of our sales process. We're going to cover two stages in each of the next three episodes and then we'll close out with the bonus and the wrap up in week five. As Brian mentioned, we're going to have a listener's choice somewhere along the way as well around interviewing best practices. Brian, anything to wrap up with today? No, like I said, uh, Bobby, please, uh, if you're looking to buy these books, buy them through the link on our podcast. Even if you uh, just get the Cliff Notes version, it's, they're, they're great reads. Every, every technology seller should, should know both of these principles. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Tech Sales Show with Bobby and Brian. Subscribe to their email list by going to bobbyandbrian.com and follow them on Twitter at Bobby Brian Sales. <laughs>